<clears throat> we are in part five of a subsection of an ongoing series on justification. And the title is going to remain the same. This is Christ's Mediatorial. I got ahead of myself. It is a mediatorial obedience. Christ's meritorious obedience in justification. And today, the subtitle would be Christ's Impeccability. And we'll talk about what impeccability is. I have something in my notes about him being mediator. So I said mediator, which is, he is that too. Just going to give a, just a brief review of what we've looked at over the past few messages. Uh, we spent some time, uh, a lot of messages, dealing with the law. The fact that... Christ is the law keeper, the law fulfiller, the law magnifier, and the law satisfier. We also talked about the fact that man, by nature, is a law breaker. He can't do anything with the law he's not qualified to, and he's a law breaker in several different ways, several different aspects of different laws that man is under, and breaks. We saw that the law is holy and good. The problem is not with the law, it's with man. So we know too that God's standard never changes and is absolutely perfect. And it is part of what is required, absolute perfection. Of course, we know that even though that's the case, we know that man cannot meet that standard and that man is still required to meet it, which is, of course, bad news for sinful man that can't meet that requirement. That means the only hope must be outside of oneself, looking to one that did keep the standard, which is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is, he is the standard. We talked about how that all have uh, fallen short, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We know that we have tagged Jesus Christ, the Lord, as the glory of God, the perfect one, the absolute perfect one, holy and righteous, who was the law keeper. We talked about that requirement, of course, for God's people, for his sheep, is met in Christ by grace, and that grace reigns through righteousness. And this is what we're talking about, the righteousness that is credited to the account for justification. What is the makeup of that concerning what Christ did for that, for us to have it? And, uh, and we need to see that in a proper way so that we can see that God is just when he justifies. In other words, he's a God of justice when he justifies. And he is, as it says in Isaiah, both a just God and a Savior. Now, here's the question in this uh, sub-series, and this is, this is the whole matter right here, the question, considering... What is the reason that Christ obeyed the law? Uh, most, I would say all, without exception, Sovereign Grace, Calvinist Reform, people in that category that hold to that doctrine and theology, they would all say, yes, he obeyed the law. But what was the reason? Did he obey it as a private person? When I say that, um, for himself? Or did he obey it as a substitute, a representative, and a mediator? Which would mean he would obey it for someone else, right? So let me go into more detail there just to go a little further. So if you say he obeyed it as a private person, most people that say that are saying the reason he obeyed it was to show himself to be a suitable or acceptable sacrifice. And most of the time, those that say that he obeyed it as a substitute representative and mediator, they say that he did so as his work 
pertains to the merit, his work in obeying the law, pertains to his merit of the overall work of both precept, which would be law obedience, and penalty, which would be paying for law disobedience of his people. We read a few times this verse. I'll quote it in Romans 2.13, For it is not the hearers of the law who are justified, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So we stated that I don't think that text is just there to show, well, man can't keep the law. Of course, that's already obvious, and that does show that. But it also shows that we must be shown or presented in a position that shows us to be law keepers. Now, couple that with that idea. God's standard is perfect. We can't fulfill that. We can't make that. He still requires it. And then Christ fulfills that for his people, and the law is connected to that, both precept and penalty. Now, there is, um, there's a lot of argument passionately on both sides of this uh, for the reason Christ obeyed the law. And I've been reading um, pro and con or uh, what is what we're presenting here and what counters. I've been reading both sides. And um, even on each side, within the camp of each side, not everybody's saying the same thing. And we talked about how that this is the case in a lot of different doctrines, right? We talked about um, there's been some argumentation the last few years, especially heavy on social media about the timing of justification. And there's eternal, there's at the cross, and there's in the life of the believer. And as you look at those people that hold to those, you can go to eternal, justification, and not everybody's saying the same thing about it. There's a variety of ideas, same with at the cross and same with in the lifetime of the believer. So some of these issues are complex and they take time to look at, examine, you know, meditate on, and uh, nail some things down, and not everybody talks the same way about everything, even within the own camps. That means we have a responsibility to not only study, come to some biblical conclusions in their context, and then be able to express these things one to another, take questions, and so on. Especially if you have, if you're any form of um, uh, you know teacher, preacher, pastor, or you write you know different doctrinal things, uh, it's important to. Uh, Know what people are saying and what they're not saying. Of course, to figure that out, you interact and you ask questions and you take questions. I think uh, what is kind of discouraging and aggravating is when, um, no matter what issue you're dealing with, there seems to be certain sides sometimes that it is slanted unfair where they'll ask questions, demand answers, but they won't take questions. Um, sometimes in childhood or in a workplace, this is considered uh, dish it out, can't take it. It's, it's There's some form of a bias. We see that everywhere. We see it in the media, where the different candidates, uh, different issues, no matter what, you're gonna have that. So, you know, fairness and cooperation, and um, if you care, you have to take the time to answer whether or not the other side is fair or not. That's not my responsibility. That should be my responsibility for me. But this is what we run into. So there's a lot of things that are assumed, misunderstood, taken out of context. So there needs to be definitions, explanations, so that we don't fail to get and take in the whole picture. Now, here lately, um, there are some people saying, now historically there's a lot of people saying this, but here lately within Sovereign Grace Calvinistic Reform, I've discovered that some people would deny 
that the person and work of Christ has any value or merit of the person and work that is given to the believer. They say, yeah, he did some things, but he didn't do those things to merit anything. And um, this means that no merit in the form of value would be in, imputed or credited to us for righteousness. And, and again, there's a variety of people that would go against um, our view and would talk about imputed righteousness as the ground of justification. They would say it's legal fiction. We know Rome says that it's legal fiction. Uh, not just them, but a lot of other people. They say it's not real. It's not enough. We're talking about imputed righteousness here. Uh, it is uh, merely paced on. It is pretend. It is play acting in reference to God play acting. And so on. There's different ideas there. And of course, if you look at the negative side when it comes to the demerit. So we are talking about the merit of Christ's righteousness in justification for salvation. So you look at the demerit side concerning what Adam did, what he messed up. It would seem to work the other way too, which Adam's demerit was not puted to our account, which would be not enough, would be legal fiction, would be insufficient in and of itself to be the ground of condemnation. Of course, Romans 5 blows that away. It's the, it's the place to go to prove both of those things, demerit and merit. And uh, of course, a lot of different historic uh, heresies would trickle in, and, and we'll be covering those as time goes on. And it would be also denying the effectual or effective nature of imputation Altogether, there are three imputations. Adam sinned to the whole human race, the elect sinned to Christ, and Christ's righteousness to the elect. And they're all three effectual, efficacious, effective. It means they work by themselves. There's strength there. There's nothing we do to bring. We, we don't activate it. We don't bring it on. We don't give permission. Nobody asked us. This is something in the, in the sovereign control and hand of God that's been degree, decreed before time and it is it comes on through and it, and it happens. Last week we started looking at some of the titles that Christ was, was labeled or called. Um, there's just a few here uh, that we did look at and there's many more probably. The Righteous One was in a text we looked at. That Just One um, Christ Jesus the Righteous. So these are some titles that lend to um, His sinlessness, His holiness, His righteousness, and we tie uh, who He is in being able to do something with the law that we can't do with the law. And we started getting into the subject of whether or not Christ was peccable or impeccable. Now to refresh your memory about peccability versus impeccability, Peccable is the potential to fall or fail or sin. Impeccability is the impossibility or the inability to sin. So we're defending a position that's part of this subject, that Christ was unable to sin. He was not free to sin. He could not sin. Now, Peccability, which let's, let's be reminded, Adam was created peccable. He had the ability to sin, and of course he did. God's will was for him to sin, and he was set up with a, a command in the form of a threat, the day you eat of that fruit, you shall surely die. And then Christ is impeccable, and the will of God, of course, Christ having to be a sinless sacrifice, he did everything perfectly because of who he was in his name. He was impeccable in his nature's, nature's. 
one person, two natures. In his divinity or his deity, in other words, him being God, he was, he was impeccable. And in his sinless humanity, he was impeccable. Those two natures make one person. When we talk about Christ, we talk about the person of Christ. We talk about the gospel. We talk about the person and work of Christ. So we don't pit the human nature against the divine nature in Christ. He is one person. His two natures uh, are together, but yet we can identify them separately because the Scripture does. Now, when we look at um, peccability again, peccability, and, and here's, here's one of these qualifiers, as I said, I made that note, a little, little caveat that um, not everybody says the same thing about a certain subject. But I would think that peccability would seem to lend more toward the idea of proof to qualify him as a suitable sacrifice. In other words, some people would say, yeah, Christ could have sinned, but he ended up not sinning, right? And because he didn't sin, now he shows himself as a suitable sacrifice. Where impeccability would seem to <clears throat> already, sh already show him as qualified because of who he is in his person. Automatically, uh, from, of course, we know eternally in his deity, but as he was made flesh, he was already qualified because he was sinless and I believe impeccability is even tied to even his human nature that he could not sin. So the latter, you know, the position I'm presenting of impeccability, and this is tied to the law, and this is tied to why Christ kept the law, and so on. Christ being impeccable in his person, both natures, should, should lend to even more assurance, I would think, more confidence, and I believe that when we read like we looked at, and we're going to look at more in Romans 5, where it talks about the sin of Adam and then the correction of that by Christ. When it talks about Christ, it said it a few times, much more. There's this pylon on the positive Christ side, and it's in reference to so many things, uh, his qualifications and what he did with his qualifications was sufficient Later, we're going to look at some things that talk about a double payment. What could that include? What does that mean? Uh, is that literal? And so on. So everything that Christ does to correct um, the problem is not just like, well, he barely made it and we, we just have enough. Much more is a mathematical. It, the, it has the word hyper in it, which has to do above what is required. Let's turn to uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Now, that's a very familiar text, and a lot of times we go to this verse, as we do a lot of other verses, for different reasons, and today is just a proof text to show his sinlessness, to show his sinlessness. Second Corinthians 5.21 For he, God, made him, Christ, to be sin for us. And of course, the us in the context of 2 Corinthians, Paul's talking to the believers or the saints at Corinth. So the us is qualified only as believers, not everyone without exception. So God made Christ to be sin and we, we have taught over and over and over again, the way this took place is, and we, and we see it in Romans 5 too, is through imputation, through the means of imputation, the crediting to the account of Christ, the sin of the us in the text, the sin of God's people. God made Christ to be sin who, Christ, knew no sin. Christ did not know sin. Why? That we, God's people, the us, in the previous part of that verse, that we, here we go again, might be made, same idea, through imputation or the crediting to the account of, a legal transfer of the merit to the account of God's people. 
that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him, in Christ. So I brought us here to see the who knew no sin. Christ knew no sin. Now we're going to look at a lot of other texts that say that in several different ways. So we believe that He was impeccable. He could not sin. We know on the surface when you read He knew no sin, it obviously means that He didn't commit any sins. And we go deeper, because we say because He could not commit sins. We've got a lot more to say about you know, diving into that, the, the reasons and so on. Go to First Peter chapter 1. I don't know if anybody historically, when I say historically, I mean in your life, has ever talked to anybody else and um, they question the sinlessness of Christ. I've talked to people that... Uh, even some that were churchgoers, but there's some, you know, mostly those that um, were not admitted they were not believers, possibly atheists or whatever, maybe some aggressive against the scripture, would would tag him as a sinner, that, that he did sin. Some, you know, have different tales, stories that um, he sinned with some of the prostitutes he hang around, hung around with. Um, there's all kind of different movies and, and things like that trying to say that he was just like anybody else in that he was a sinner. So we're, we're, all we're looking at is, I mean, we know that he wasn't, and most people that we hang around with doctrinally would say that he didn't, which meant he kept the law. But we're going further, like, why did he keep the law, and why did he not sin? Verse uh, 18, 1 Peter 1, verse 18. For as much as you were not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, let me, let me just make a mention here of um, some of the Figurative, figurative language in, say, for example, Revelation, where it talks about streets of gold. It's, it's figurative. It's not literal. One of the reasons I know that is because several other things in Revelation are not literal. But here's a text that, when we compare Scripture to Scripture, it says here that gold is a corruptible thing. So keep that in mind. Those that, uh, you know, those that would be immature in their mind talking about all the things that they think they're going to do or want to do when they quote unquote get to heaven, whether it be astro project themselves or go talk to granny, you know, and go hang out and do different things rather than just see Christ and worship Christ. Those same people might be talking about mansions and what they're going to look like and all the splendor of like different um, precious gems and stones and which of course all is a distraction from Christ. You know, this, this is just language saying, you know what, it's going to be different up there than it's here, right? But people turn everything into idolatry. Corruptible things as silver and gold from your notice here, from your vain conversation or, or lifestyle or thoughts received by the tradition from your fathers, your past religious leaders. But what are we redeemed by, those that Christ died for? Verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, notice this, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So we know that in the Old Testament, there were certain rules that were mandated about what kind of animals you could use for a sacrifice. A male, the, the best of the batch, which meant they're not crippled, they're not, there's no faults in them, they're, they're, they're perfect, you know, no flaws. Of course, that typified and pictured, foreshadowed Christ's coming, 
who would be the Lamb of God, as John the Baptist announced him, when he, you know, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, which meant here he was. All this prophecy lined up to show this one. Here he is. He's, he's the one that is the Lamb, which is referring to he's going to be sacrificed for sin. And to do that, you have to be without sin, which is without blemish or without spot who was verily foreordained before the foundation of the world. He was appointed ahead of time to do this. This was the deal that was struck in the covenant, the agreement that would contain promises and conditions and so on. So it was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest or made known in these last times for you, who by him do you believe in God? Don't miss that part right there. This is showing that faith is a gift that you don't do out of your own flesh, who by him do you believe in God. You don't believe in God of your own, out of your own strength, but by him you do believe in God. That raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. So there he is in verse 19. He's spoken of as being the lamb without blemish or without spot. Go to chapter 2, 1 Peter 2. More talk of the sinlessness of Christ, which we're defending impeccability that he could not sin. It was not possible for him to sin. Verse 21, for even hereunto you are called, because Christ also suffered for us, and this us again is to the elect, to believers, to saints, suffered for, the word for referring to, in the place of, in the stead of, in other words, a substitute, mediator, representative, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Now, Peter here is not saying, you know, this is the only reason Christ came and, and, and did all these things. The only reason is just to be an example. Now, we know he did this in reference to glorifying the Father primarily, and then to save his people. And then his people can look at him as an example. But he was not just, you know, primarily suffering as an example. Let's not get the cart before the horse in, in, in reference to priority of why he did it. Verse 22, who did no sin. Speaking of Christ, who did no sin. Neither was any guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. He's doing the will of the Father. Remember, that's what he was there for. So think about what we had, what I had mentioned that maybe in some cases when you deal with people with doctrine, They're unfair and they don't want to answer your questions, but they make you answer yours. And I said, dish it out, can't take it. Think of the extreme um, distinction between how man is, sinful man, and how Christ is in his humility, right? These people were dishing it out to Christ, the one, first of all, who deserved reverence, worship and so on because of who he was as both God and perfect man. And yet he he took it, right? They dished it out to him and he took it in the most perfect way. Verse 24, still speaking of Christ, who his own self bear our sins in his body. The word bear there means carry. 
I'll just change the word to make it flow, who in his own self carried our sins in his body. And again, the only method, the only way of doing this is through having it on his account, him being responsible for it and dealing with it when it comes to receiving the wrath of God. He bears sins in his own body on the tree that we, God's people, being dead to sins, now, of course, should live unto righteousness, going back to Christ, by whose stripes we are healed. All the things that we needed. We had this demerit that was on our account from Adam. And then after we're born, we're born with the sin nature. We add our own demerits on top of it, talking about some pile up. And then those need to be removed. And they're not only removed, but the positive righteousness is put on top of it. We had, we had mentioned last week that some people, it's a kind of a phrase that we use here in America at least, um, talking about having a clean slate. Well, this is not just a clean slate. In other words, we talked about how that God's people are not only pardoned and forgiven. That would be a clean slate. We have a full slate. We're not just pardoned and forgiven. We have righteousness on top of it, imputed to our account. So we are, we are seen as He is seen by God the Father. If we were only pardoned and forgiven, that would only bring us up to the status of Adam before the fall, who was innocent. We're not just declared innocent, we're declared righteous. And so why, we're, why are we talking about this? It has to do with Christ's law keeping. Was it part of the righteousness that's given to us? Or is it only his death? Or is it the combination as a complete full whole merit of his complete work? All right, that's what, that's what we're talking I mean, I, I think I've said that a few times through this series. But uh, look at uh, t- verse 25. Uh, For you were as sheep going astray. So we know God's sheep, before they're found, they're lost. And when they're lost, it means before they're saved, they're going astray. They, don't, they can't find their way until they're given a new mind and a new heart and given his righteousness. And then we see he is the way. And my sheep hear my voice, they follow me and so on. They weren't goats and turned into sheep. They've always been sheep. They were just were lost sheep and then found sheep. Goats have always been goats. They've always been hated by God. Sheep have all been loved by God, even when they're lost sheep. I think we've got a good grip on that. For you were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and the bishop of your souls. Capital S, shepherd, capital B, bishop. The word bishop means overseer. Go to Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7. More language to, to prove his sinlessness. Verse 24. Now, in the book of Hebrews, the writer is writing Hebrew Christians who were used to, and some had, most had spent time in the Old Covenant. There's this time period is the Old Covenant transition. It's when the Old Covenant had stopped, and now the time has changed the transition unto the New Covenant. Christ, of course, is the high priest in the New Covenant, by the shedding of his blood, the old covenant involved many priests who were sinners who shed the blood of animals, which could never take away sin. And we see these contrasts of these uh, two covenants, old and new. This whole book of Hebrews is talking about the inferiority of the old covenant and the superiority of the new covenant. 
And it just got done talking about some, some priests, but it says, but verse 24, but this man, speaking of Christ, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. So one of Christ's titles is he is the great high priest. And that's unchanging, right? The old covenant priests, there was a change of priests. They kept dying, so they had to be replaced. And they were sinners, so they never were qualified to seal the deal forever. But this man, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, notice, we want to look at the idea of ability. He is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto him, come unto God by him. All right, so the word uttermost, we had talked about already the much more in Romans 5. This is, this is in the same club, the same idea. It is enough, sufficient, fully sufficient, there's no doubts. There's nothing lacking. It's not just up barely. It is fully and there is enough. So much so all this, these math words that go above. Uttermost is one of those words. Seeing he ever lives, right? Because the other priests, they died and they had to be replaced. And here he is. Uh, one with an unchangeable priesthood, he ever lives to make intercession for them. That means he prays for them. He prays on their behalf. He prays for them and so on. Verse 26, for such a high priest, capital H, capital P, talking about Christ, for such a high priest became us, he, he was fitting to be for us, Notice, here's a description. Who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Sinless. This is in impeccability language here. This shows <clears throat> a unique person. One in contrast to the high priest that, that were not qualified to really put away sin like he is with the unchangeable priesthood based on who he was and what he did, which is really what the gospel is. Now look what it said that he did not need, verse 27, who needed not daily as those high priests to offer sacrifice first for his own sins, and then the sins of his people. For this he did once, the latter part, for the sins of his people, when he offered up himself. So that part about offering sins for him, offering up sacrifices for his own sins, he didn't need to do that because he didn't have any of his own. The only sins he had were those that he took upon himself from the ones that he loved. And he had the Father dealt with those on him in reference to wrath because imputation of the elect's sins was so effectual that now he owned them and he was accountable for them and he was actually legally declared guilty for them and he put them away by the sacrifice of himself. But notice the contrast. He didn't have any. These other guys did, and this is showing again the inferiority and the superiority of the, of the covenant contrasts. Let's go back to chapter 2 of uh, Hebrews. I don't know how much more um, as we go in this series that I, I might come back and go in deeper in some of these statements and some of these verses that we're reading this morning and with some of the verses that we looked at in the past few weeks. Hebrews 2 and verse 7. You have made him a little lower than the angels. 
You crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You subjected all things under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he did not leave anything not subjected to him. But now we do not see all things having been subjected to him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. For what reason? For the suffering of death. Crowned with glory and honor, that he, Christ, by the grace of God, should taste death for all. We've gone over the all here before. Some even add for all men in some of the more modern translations. But it's referring to whom he suffered death for, all that he suffered death for. And we don't have to belabor that point. I mean, it's easy to see that the effect of his death proved who he died for. In other words, the effect proves the extent. We've worn that out and we're not done with it. We'll keep talking about it. Verse 10, For it became him, and there again, this is the idea of it was befitting of him, um, for whom are all things and by whom are all things. Notice, in bringing many sons into glory, these are the ones that he saved, to, perf to perfect the captain of their salvation through sufferings. Notice there's a lot about sufferings. So we, we've read not just in Hebrews, but other texts so far about sufferings. And we initially said, you know, are, is there value in the sufferings of Christ? Right? Not just the three hours on the tree, but he suffered throughout his life. Are there, is there any value? What did it do? Is there any value in pre-sufferings to the cross and even at the cross? Some say sufferings have nothing to do with it. It's just the death. So we'll continue to look at this. Verse 11, For both he who sanctifies... You remember the idea of sanctifying, it means to set apart. He who sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all of one, capital O, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them, those that are sanctified, it's believers, he's not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will declare your name to my brothers. And in the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, and when it says, and again, it means another place in the Old Testament, it was said. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold me and the children whom you have given me. Of course, God's children were given to Christ in election. And Christ was there. Representative, substitute, mediator, surety, and all the rest. Notice this. Here we go, verse 14. This starts to get into his, his incarnation or taking on flesh. Since then, the children have partaken of flesh and blood. God's people were human beings, in other words. Talking about Christ. He also himself likewise partook of the same. In other words, he had flesh and blood. He was a real human being. Remember 1 John, when we, when we get back in there, and we've already seen a lot up to chapter 3 is where we ended, the uh, heresy and the false gospel of the Gnostics were to deny his flesh and blood human body. Here's a, just another witness of the testimony that that's what he had. And he had to have that what does the rest of the sentence say? Why he had to have it? That through death, you can't, you just can't have a mirage or a phantom die. You have to have a body. That through death, he might destroy him that had power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver those who were in fear of death, 
were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For truly, he did not take on the nature of angels. Remember, it said he was made a little lower than the angels. But he took on or took hold of the seed of Abraham, who Abraham was a human being, flesh and blood. Therefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like his brothers. Why? That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation, which is satisfaction, for the sins of his people. Now, notice there, to be made like his brothers. I can't remember if I have any more in my notes down here, but it talks about in other places being made like unto sinful flesh. Made like unto sinful flesh. This just means he had a body. It doesn't mean that he was sinful. That idea of sinful flesh just means he took on the same type of body and he had a human nature like we have a a human nature but without sin there's enough clarity in what we've read so far uh, to easily prove that so here's my point that when when it says it behooved him to be made like unto his brothers that is not um that is not all the way in the sense of to be a sinner. It's not exhaustive, in other words. That's the word I was trying to think of. It just means a, a human body, but without sin. If it was exhaustive, it would say a human body with sin. But he, he was that was not his makeup. This is why we're talking about impeccability. Um, Verse 18, we'll end in this verse in this section here. For in that he himself has suffered, having been tempted, he is able to rescue those who are being tempted. So, This Christ suffered. He had a human body. It says that he was tempted in the desert by the devil. And we'll talk about what that meant. The idea of being tempted. There's a lot of things go through people's minds of what he thought when he was being tempted. Whether or not it was just like to be tested or tempted as in the devil reeled him in in reference to caused him to desire to want to sin. That's what some people think of when it comes to this idea of temptation. That all gets into this whole idea of why did God uh, have Christ keep the law? Was it this thing of the example? And it's like, well, now you can be inspired. Christ kept the law, which meant He resisted temptation. He could have sinned, but he didn't. Now you don't sin because you have this ability not to now. And so (laughs) there's a complete difference in those two views that just one, I think, is weaker or softer. And it's spoken of for different reasons. Um, John 17, let's go there. We go here a lot, but this is for a different reason. Start in verse 1. Now, this is a prayer right before they came and took him away to crucify him. Remember, um, up until here, and and I think all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when he was uh, doing different things, and um, they were trying to grab him, trying to kill him, trying to stone him, these different things, and he would always slip through the crowd. And um, it would say in the narrative, it would explain the commentator sort of the, as it was written. This was done. Why? Because his hour was not yet come. 
Well, here his hour is getting ready to come right here. There was this waiting, waiting, anticipating. This is why the whole world was created. And now it is like getting more focused here. Jesus spoke these words and lifted up his eyes into heaven. We're in verse 1. And said, Father, here it is, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that your Son also may glorify you. There's God's chief overarching purpose throughout eternity to glorify himself in the death of the Son. Even as you have given him, when he says him, he's referring to himself. Authority over all flesh. So the Father, remember Christ has submitted himself and temporarily in, in his condensa- uh, condescension down from his throne in the incarnation, this is a work of humility. He put aside his reputation, submitted himself to the Father in humility. He acts as a subordinate to the Father and When this takes place, even the Father gives authority to Christ over all flesh. For what reason? So that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. As, of course, the Father gave the elect to Christ, the ones that he's getting ready to perform this work for so that they can have eternal life. Verse 3, we've worn this one out. And this, he just talked about eternal life. He said, and this is life eternal. What is life eternal? That they may know you. Talking about God's people. The only true God, not just any old God, small g, the only true God, capital G. There's only one. All else are idols. Eternal life is that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Verse 4, I have glorified you upon the earth. Now notice, he prayed in verse 1, glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. And here in verse 4, he says, I have glorified you on, upon the earth. Past tense. And then he says this, I have finished, past tense, the work which you have given me to do. Now, previous to the cross, he did a work that he actually finished. And in doing so, he glorified God in it. What does that mean? Does it have any value? Is it tied to any of his obedience from his incarnation? up until his hour just now came. Are people just going to discount that and say, ah, it's talking about the cross. It's not talking about the cross. He's, he still yet has to do that work. And when you put those two things together, it's one complete work. And that complete work has value. And that complete work involves suffering. He'd already suffered up until this point in time, and he's going to suffer like he's never suffered before. So in other words, his, his, his obedience is going to culminate in when his hours come and he's going to be at the cross. Verse 5, And now, Father, glorify me with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. All right, so I, you know, I brought us there for verse four, and we're going to keep that in mind as we as we go on with other um, messages. I'm going to stop there because the next section of uh, text is kind of lengthy. All I'm doing today is, of course, we did a review to try to get everything in your mind, and I wanted to couple it with some of the things said about the Lord Jesus Christ, who He is in His person, how He is in reference to some of the strengths that are spoken of in the Scripture, and I believe it's pretty clear, and we're not done talking about it, the fact that he could not sin. He was not able to sin. You know how we look at total depravity sometime, and we you know, say, for example, 
uh, I think it is in uh, John 5. He's talking to some religious people. And he said, you will not come to me that you might have eternal life. And that's just not talking about a physical presence and position. It's talking about you won't come to me by faith, believing in me, that you might have eternal life. And then in chapter 6 and verse 44, so here is in 5 it says you will not. In 44 of chapter 6 it says, No man can come unto me except the Father which sent me draw him. So you have the will not in chapter 5, and you have the cannot in chapter 6. What one do you think drives the other? The weak view is saying, well, you they can't come to Christ because they won't. But I believe total depravity, the doctrine of that with all the other testimony of Scripture put together, when they compare those two, the, the, the cannot drives the will not. They won't because they can't. Take this idea of Christ in reference to sin. Is it that Christ wanted to, but he didn't? Or is it because Christ didn't because he can't, <laughs> based on who he is? There's a big difference in that. And as you think about that, uh, it would maybe depend on really what you were concerned with. Those that would talk about peccability, that he could sin, might say, well, you have to have that there to ensure that he was full of human, just like us, right? And then you show the strength of him resisting that temptation, which is an inspiration and an example so that we can resist temptation. Or we see it as, Christ's impeccability. He could not sin. Therefore, <laughs> it's a done deal. He won't because he can't. And then we see assurance and confidence in it's like the much more and the uttermost language. It's like there is not a possibility that this thing is going to fail. We don't have to wait and see. Is he going to make it? Is he going to sin? He was already qualified. He didn't have to wait till the end to prove himself. Even in this prayer we read in John, in John 5, it, it, that's not what that was about. I finished the work. I made it without sinning. It's not that. He was already equipped and qualified, and he couldn't sin. And with that person, with those characteristics, he obeyed the law, and then he was getting ready to finish the rest of the work at the cross, paying the penalty of the law. There, yeah, go, go ahead. I'm done. I was getting to say any questions or comments. Okay. Yeah, I'm done. Yeah. Go ahead. No, uh, you said John 5, it was John 17. With the, uh, uh, when, you okay. John 5 is, you will not. John 6 is, no man can come unto me. And John 17 is the prayer about, I finished the work. So I might, I might have misspoke there. Um, for those listening on video, we have these three gentlemen for from Germany here again. Been having a real good time. Uh, been some of the other church members getting together and, and eating meals together. Um, Joel is going back Tuesday and the twins Simon and Philip are staying until the 31st so um, it's been a real good time and anybody that is listening and can get here before Tuesday to see Joel or can't get there that early come until the rest of July to meet the others even if it's driving a couple hours. Any other comments or questions? I like the, so when you touched on how some people get the idea where Christ resisted sin to show that we could possibly do that, um, it's kind of, you know, you're just doing 
comparing certain opposites and like the opposite of that we're born under sin so even if yeah even if i never sinned for the rest of my life and i resisted sin for the rest of my life life after birth i still was born under that even one sin or whatever yeah so i'm done I'm, i can't not sin yeah you can't start to fix so what's messed just up like how yeah. christ can't right he won't sin because he can't sin i can't resist sin because I've already sinned once or was born under sin. Yeah. So. As far as you can't obey like Christ obeyed. Right. Even if I obeyed like Christ for my whole life uh, after Got birth. Problems, still problems of your past. Yeah. yeah. So, and we'll say some more about this part of it. When um, we are uh, given His righteousness and we have... Um, spiritual life imparted to us, you know, regeneration and indwelling, and given faith and repentance, uh, there are times when God does, through His power and His Spirit work in us, helps us resist some sin. Now, the amount of that flows into the whole, <laughs> I mean, to the whole argument of the Christian life, and you have the antinomian and you have the legalist, but the Scripture says... Sometimes sin is resisted, temptation is resisted, and of course that is encouraged throughout the Scripture to do that, you know. And then even the prayer we're to pray, we're asking that we not even be led into temptation so that we don't have to face temptation. Yeah. And so... Um, not for righteousness. Not for a righteousness. Sinning less is a side effect of being... Uh, having God working in us. It's not something I'm doing to get something out of it. Yeah, and then... I might sin less through my life as a Christian my, only because of him for, working in And not for a righteousness. Yeah. You, you might sin less, you know... Somewhat. For your own physical salvation so you don't end up in prison, so you don't destroy your life with foolishness. You know, you gain, right. you gain wisdom... And you, you see, you see wisdom in your in, in your physical life, but not for righteousness. Well, I also, yeah, you would. I don't even think you're going to recognize that you're sinning. Yeah, because you're. It's going to be a side effect. And of, you see the strength of sin more in your life. Like, yeah. So you, it's yeah. You, you more you, aware. You can see where. Okay, that's gonna. You don't imagine that wrong. you right. sin less. You see. You. You, see, you can pick it out quicker. You, yeah, yeah. You, you see the strength of More it. discernment. Right. Well, let, let's, let me remind everybody of this. Uh, when we start talking about sin and less versus not, there is an overwhelming fact that, that I'll, shy, I'll, I'll shout it. You know, I don't think anybody knows what I'm going to say. Um, I know I talk a lot about frequency of sin versus obedience. But we know this, that before we were regenerated and converted, every single thing was sin. So, of course, after that, we are sinning less because all we did is sin before. Yeah. Now, we can, we can wear that badge. You know? uh, that's like the first step. Um, I, not many people even mention that, but that is a sense in which for sure we're so sinning less. Plowing on the ground is sin for the Everything. Your sins have been transferred to another account. Yeah. Right. Which is Christ. Right. So all the, the 637 is all the Father gives you. So come to me and him that comes to me, I will know I like that. Uh, you're one of his electors. No way you can be cast out. Right. All right. So today we have, um, <laughs> what do we call that? <clears throat> Seafood boil. Some people call it seafood boil. Some people call it shrimp boil. Some people call it uh, crab boil. Uh, I heard that word in a Three Dog Night song one time. And that was Shambhala. Never mind, that's the wrong word. I knew some of those older people would get that. <coughs> but it's got <clears throat> shrimp, crab, Little baby, <clears throat> little short pieces of <coughs> corn, garlic, onions, little sausages. <clears throat> I'm getting a cough fit right at the end. 
My mouth watered. I got choked on my own saliva about the food. And then there's some kind of seasoning that uh, puts this thing together. And then chicken, chicken breast. <clears throat>